St. Paul. I'm glad you're here to hear the word of the Lord with me. We're beginning a, a, a new season in the church here, the season of Lent, which is a, a 40 day uh, walk alongside Jesus to the cross. And so we'll be hearing about how that happened today and in the coming Sundays. We'll also be uh, starting a new sermon series uh, this week, which will go throughout Lent. Um, will follow how Jesus knows our suffering, how he was, he was here and he suffered with us and, and for us and really can empathize with, with what we're going through. So I uh, will focus on that in the sermon today. You'll hear more about it. And uh, today we'll be, we'll be focusing most specifically on the suffering of, of betrayal. So we'll see uh, the pain that betrayal can bring to us, and, as well as what it did for, for Jesus. Let's begin with our, our first hymn, uh, Amazing Grace. Thank you. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our, our song, Oh, How Good is Christ the Lord. Jesus, be by my side when friends are unfaithful to me. You were betrayed by a close friend, and you know the anguish of betrayal. When it seems like I am without a friend in the world, reassure me that you are with me and I will be with you for eternity. Amen. You may be seated for our first reading. first reading today is from Psalm 41. You're going to see that, that all of our readings from Scripture today have something to do with, uh, with betrayal. And in this, this psalm, this believer expresses the, the pain of, of a close friend of betraying him. He says, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. But may you have mercy on me, Lord. Raise me up that I may repay them. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, you hold you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 12, and it, it deals with you know, how we uh, properly react to, uh, to betrayal and to people fighting against us or hurting us. Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite the, uh, the young children forward for a, a children's message. Thank you. Young children can come forward. Thank you guys for coming up. Do you notice something different in church today compared to last week? Yeah, what? The color changed, yeah. Yeah, the color changed. What color is it? Purple, yeah, purple. Yeah, you know, uh, in church, when colors, when the colors change, it means something. It means something is changing in church. Yeah, <laughs> you ever thought about that? Yeah, what? Um, it does, it, it, so that when the colors change at church, it means we might be focusing on a different section of the Bible. Um, absolutely, yeah. And this, at this time, when the, when the colors turn purple, that means we're focusing on Jesus on his way to the cross. And uh, the other thing about purple, purple is a, that's a color of royalty. So kings and queens, they wear, like purple is a, a symbol of, of royalty. So um, we remember how Jesus is our king. What, uh, what do kings wear on their head? Crowns. Crowns, yeah. Do you see a crown somewhere up here on the, the clock? Yeah, Ariella, what is it? No. This thing, right? Yeah, yeah, it's one on both sides, yeah. And what, what is that crown made of? Uh, gold. Thorns, yeah, it is the color gold. But it's made of thorns and potent. Yeah. Um, that reminds us of how when our King Jesus was dying on the cross, he had a crown of thorns on his head. It was very painful for him. And it helps us remember how Jesus suffered and he died to pay for our sins, that we would be forgiven by God. So that's a, that's a little bit about our focus in church this season with, with purple. You'll hear more about it. Um, in the coming Sundays. So let, thank you guys for coming up. Let's close with a prayer. Bow your heads and close your hands. Dear Jesus, thank you for being our king, for leading us, uh, for going all the way to the cross and, and experiencing much pain uh, to save us and to forgive us of our sins. Please help us always to believe in you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Thank you, guys. You may go back to your seats. I invite you all to please stand. We'll all speak the, our final verse of the day together from Hebrews chapter 4. 
We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Our Gospel reading today will be from Mark chapter 14. It will be a little bit longer. So this year in in our our season of Lent, um, for the Gospel reading, we'll be reading the Passion History. So really just the the story of what happened that last day of Jesus' life, starting with his Last Supper with his disciples, uh, on through the night uh, to where he would die on the cross the next day. So we'll be, we'll be reading the Passion History over these next, these next weeks. Um, and this will also serve as the basis for the sermon today, especially the parts about Judas betraying Jesus. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. You can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus asked, or Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day, when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, you Lord Christ. Christ. You may be seated for our hymn of the day.
I'm going with this. Here's your weekly, uh, your weekly reminder that uh, Pastor's human uh, left my notes in my office. So thanks for your patience. On a, on a more serious note, um, uh, one of the most, one of the questions that Christians struggle with the most is if there is a God, as we believe there is, why does God allows so much suffering in the world. Why do, why do kids die? Why are there such you know, wicked wars uh, and evil men making so many people suffer? We don't know exactly why. Uh, we don't know all the reasons why. But we do know why it isn't. We know the reason that God has allowed suffering is, is it's, we know it's not because God is cold or unloving or distant from us. Um, he's not like, you know, like you think about how we react to um, ants dying. Like if you accidentally step on an ant, you're like, oh, Oh well, there's like 50 trillion more of them in the world. They'll be fine. No, that's not how God. That's not how God views us in the world. He. And how do we know that? Well, well, God came here in the person Jesus and suffered with us here. He suffered for us. And if God suffered with us and for us, how could how could he not care what we're going through? We know absolutely the reason for suffering in the world is not that God doesn't care about us. You know, Jesus knows our suffering. He's been here. He's, he's been through it. And he can empathize with, with us. And especially today, we're going to focus on, you know, Jesus knows our suffering of betrayal. Uh, have you ever been betrayed? One of the, uh, I know a guy who recently, uh, and his, his story of, of betrayal is, is the most shocking I've heard in, in recent history, at least. Uh, story of betrayal of somebody that I know. But this uh, this guy, you know, he, he, lived, he lives in Calgary, and uh, he had a roommate, and uh, they had uh, fifteen thousand in the bank together, and they were they were going to use that to you know to support their their living, rent out the place that they had. But then his uh, his roommate goes and he he takes money in the bank and then runs off to Toronto with it, leaving this guy in, in Calgary without any way to pay for rent. He becomes homeless, goes out of his car. His, his roommate betrayed him. Now I don't, I don't know how you've been betrayed um, maybe uh, the teenagers in the room. Have you guys had like a friend or somebody who thought a friend <coughs> betray you in, in school? Somebody you know, talk about you behind your back? 
Maybe you think back to your school days that happened to you. Uh, maybe it was it was someone that you had you'd opened up to, and it was one of the only people you could trust. And then they, they stabbed you in the back. Hopefully not literally, but figuratively, they, they betray your trust. You know, there's something about the unexpected nature of betrayal that we're so defenseless against it. Like even if you're you're tough against other things, uh, betrayal can just you know, blindside you. Do you know what blindsiding means? The football players probably they know what that means. Imagine you're in a football game and uh, a player from the opposing team comes and hits you, but you didn't see it coming, right? It's coming from the side or from the back. And if you had seen it coming, you'd be able to brace yourself and you know, push back a little bit. But since you don't see the hit coming, bam, it lays you out, right? Your, your, your butt's on the ground. That's, that's, that's being blindsided. Betrayal is like that. It, it, it slams you to the ground because it's, it's someone you trust, someone that you've maybe broken bread with. You, you eaten with them, they've been in your home, they've been close to you, and then, and then they do you wrong. And you wonder, how, how could they do this to me? And that's what betrayal is like for us. What was, what was betrayal like for Jesus? Well, Jesus was betrayed by a man named Judas. Who's Judas? Well, Judas was one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. He was one of Jesus' closest friends, a man that Jesus had been mentoring for years. Eventually, Judas became the, the treasurer of the group, the treasurer of the disciples, so he kept track of the money people were donating to their ministry. But you see, Judas had, he had struggles uh, and temptations dealing with, with greed. You know, bit by bit, he, he had been stealing from them all, from his friends, from Jesus, taking some of the money for himself. And then, you know, finally, when this all came to a, a head, it was Holy Week, so it's, it's the week of Jesus' death, uh, leading up to his, his resurrection. Judas finds out that he has the opportunity to make some money. And the deal is that in Jerusalem, where they were, most of the religious leaders hated Jesus. And they had been plotting, they'd, they'd been wanting to get rid of Jesus for a long time, they wanted to kill him. But what stopped them were the common people, right? They knew the crowds would riot if they took Jesus in public. So they knew whatever they, whatever they did, however they were going to get to Jesus, it had to be in secret. So Judas identified that well, this would be a great opportunity for a traitor to step in and, and then hand Jesus over to his enemies and get paid for it. So Judas agreed to betray Jesus for, for some money, 30 pieces of silver. Now, one of the interesting things about this betrayal uh, is that Jesus saw it coming. It, it blindsided the other disciples. They were shocked, but, but Jesus knew ahead of time. He is the all-knowing Son of God. So while they were having a supper, this is the, what we call the Last Supper, Jesus ate with his disciples. Jesus said to them, they're all sitting around the table, truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. And then he gave a piece of bread to Judas, basically saying, it, it's you. So now we might ask some questions. Why, why did Jesus call out Judas publicly like that? One of you is going to betray me. By the way, it's, it's, it's you. 
Jesus was giving him an opportunity to repent and not to go down this path. Why didn't Jesus stop him? He, he knew what he, what he was planning, what he was going to do. But Jesus wanted to get to the cross. Now, Jesus' main purpose as God coming to earth was to die as a sacrifice for humanity's sin. Jesus could have died a different way, but, but Judas had chosen this path of betrayal, and now Jesus, in his power, was now going to turn this bad thing around into something good. Later on that evening, when, when Jesus was, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, we'll hear more about that next week, Judas came up to Jesus, and Jesus told him, do what you came for, friend showing how much it, it hurt. And then Judas gave the signal to Jesus' enemies, the one I kiss is the man. That was the signal that, that Judas gave to Jesus' enemies. So the, one, the one you're looking for, the one you want to kill, is the man I kiss. That's Jesus. And so Judas kissed Jesus. How cold is that? This show of, of intimate affection, brotherly affection. Is that what Judas used to portray Jesus? And you know, at that point, the other disciples were, you know, they were in shock, blindsided by this. As, as Jesus' enemies bind him up and, and take him away. How could one of them betray their master? How, how could one of them betray God like that? So you remember that uh, the, the man I was telling you about who, whose roommate took off with the money and went to Toronto? Um, when he told me this, this, this story, he says that whenever he shares the story of that, uh, no one seems to really understand uh, what he went through. And he's right, you know, no one has been in his shoes in that exact situation. No one really understands what he went through. But you know what, there, there is one person who does know exactly what he went through and what we're going through too. And, and that's Jesus. Jesus knows it all. He's experienced betrayal himself while he was on earth. When we're suffering, especially with betrayal, I want you to know that when we talk to Jesus, when we pray to him, he gets it. He, he gets what that feels like to happen to him. He empathizes with you. Pray to him about these things. Talk to him. And he will help you. Betrayals, they, uh, and they, uh, they seem to come out of nowhere, right? They, 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 uh, they blindside you. And that's why uh, they're so painful. But you know what else is blindsiding? Grace. Undeserved love. For example, the person who was betrayed, forgiving his betrayer. That's exactly what Jesus did. You know, actually, Jesus, he was showing grace to Judas the, the whole time. Loving him, mentoring him, training him, giving him a chance to repent at the end and not go down that path. Jesus is the great grace giver. He never gave up on Judas, even though Jesus, uh, Judas had, had given up on him. Jesus allowed himself to be betrayed. You know, remember, he saw it coming. He allowed it to happen. Just as it was written about him in the scriptures. 
and that led to Jesus dying on a cross, which God the Father turned into a sacrifice to pay for all of humanity's sin. Even the sin of Judas, yes. Jesus died for the sin of betrayal that Judas had committed against him. Jesus was showing grace to us. He suffered all that for us and used his death to pay for our sins. You know, uh, I've, I've heard it said that, that this world is a, it's a dog-eat-dog world. Have you heard that? And that, that idea is that we're living in a place, in, in a world where people are going to do whatever it takes to succeed even if it means hurting other people, betraying their, their closest friends, whatever it takes to get ahead, they're gonna do it. Dog eat dog world. In this dog eat dog, this broken world, you know, we have slipped in to these sins too. What are some of the sins around betrayal that, that Jesus has shown us grace for? Uh, maybe we've reacted inappropriately to betrayal. You know, adding to adding our own sin to the sin committed against us, harboring hate in our hearts for the person, seeking revenge when we know revenge is not ours to take. That's that's up to God. He'll take care of that. That's not our place. And you know, uh, chances are, we have not only been the victims of betrayal, we've probably also been the perpetrators. Like, yeah, we probably haven't sold someone out and gotten them killed. But we've probably betrayed the trust of a friend before, a family member. Think about how this happened to Judas. Judas was a Christian. Judas was a fellow believer, a disciple of Christ. And he fell to this temptation. He, he valued money more than Jesus. Haven't we done that? We valued a lot more things than Jesus at times. And Je Jesus is the most precious treasure we have. He's our God. He's our Savior. How does that happen? <clears throat> Maybe we've um, we valued the approval of, of friends more than doing what's right. Maybe we valued our reputation over Jesus' reputation. For example, if you know, you're in a conversation with a group of people and all of a sudden it turns into a, a Christian bashing session, you ever been in one of those where people are all talking talking bad about religion and, and all that Jesus stuff? And you see an opportunity where you could step in and, and share what the gospel of Jesus really is and why you're happy and proud to be a disciple of Christ. But then you, you don't say anything and you let Jesus' name be torn down and drag through the dirt. Or maybe uh, we value ourselves more than what Jesus says. Like if we want to be Christian, we want to be children of God, but then the moment it gets difficult, or our lives get challenged in any way, all of a sudden Jesus isn't very important anymore. We do all this stuff, reacting in ungodly ways to betrayal, betraying others at times, and even to our shame, betraying our Lord. And it can lead you to wonder, how in the world does God and his son Jesus still put up with me? Like, let alone love me, how does he put up with me, considering the things I've done? Jesus still died for us. He went on, he, 
he endured this betrayal along with much other suffering and then willingly hung on a cross for us. And he foresaw all of our sin and our betrayals coming thousands of years later, just as he foresaw the betrayal of Judas. He still took our sins and the punishment we deserved for them upon himself to offer us forgiveness. If we compare ourselves to Judas here for a moment, you know, Judas rejected this offer of forgiveness. And he ended up killing himself. He thought, how, how could Jesus ever forgive me for what I did to him? I, I mean, I got him killed. How could Jesus forgive me? But by God's grace, you and I have a different result than Judas. Because the Holy Spirit has convinced us that Jesus didn't just make his sacrifice for other people, he made it for all people, for us, for me. Why would, why would Jesus be willing to do that for me, for you? Because of his infinite love, the love of God. The Apostle Paul, uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, he talks about this 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 infinite love of Jesus. He says, the Apostle Paul prays that we would grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. This, this love of God in Jesus, it, it is so big and so wide, it surpasses knowledge. It's so big that our puny human brains can't fully comprehend it. That's grace. And my hope and my prayer for all of us is that we would be blindsided in the best possible way, blindsided by Jesus' grace. His infinite love for you that never ends, even though we don't deserve it. I recently heard a story of, uh, of blindsiding grace. Uh, there's a, it involves a, a serial killer in the state of, of Washington, a man named uh, Gary, Gary Ridgway. And at the time, he was the most uh, prolific serial killer in American history. He, they estimate he murdered uh, maybe 60 women mostly young young women um, engaged in acts of necrophilia with, with you know, the bodies and dumped them in the woods. So he finally got caught and he pled guilty to, to, to like 42 or 43 murders. And in court, you know, everybody, all the victims, family and their friends were getting up and they had their words to say to this guy. They get up and say, they they be like they they mention how how painful it was that he took their loved one away from them, how they that person meant nothing to him but everything to them, and now he took them away. That people would stand up and say how much they hated him, how much they wanted him to suffer in jail for the rest of his life, and rot in hell. And you know they got a point. This, this is a horrible man, horrible horrible man. And then one guy uh, got up, a father of one of the murdered daughters, and he says, you know, there's a, a lot of people in the room that, that hate you here today, uh, but I'm not one of them. Although you have made it very difficult for me to, to do what I believe. And then he said, sir, uh, I forgive you. forgive you for murdering my daughter. And that, that actually brought a tear to this serial killer's eye. That's blindsiding grace. And that's the type of grace that Jesus has for us. 
You know, when the Apostle Paul says, when we were still sinners, Christ died for us, this is what he's talking about. When we were broken, when we were unlovable and unworthy, Christ died for us. He loved us and forgave us. That's blindsided grace that Jesus gives to you and to me. Now, full of that grace, imagine, imagine the blindsiding power when we show that same grace to others, especially those who have betrayed us. By the grace of Jesus, he equips us to do this and to forgive those who hurt us. And you know, the more someone has hurt us, the more unexpected our forgiveness is, the more impactful it is. Because to them, the people we forgive, who, who don't deserve it, this, this forgiveness, this grace, it seems to come out of nowhere. Where'd that come from? We know where it comes from. It comes from Jesus. It's the grace of Jesus overflowing in our lives. And that's the kind of thing that leads other people to Jesus. They ask, how in the world could that person forgive me for what I did to them? How? You know, we, uh, we don't know all the reasons that God allows suffering in the world, but we, we do know this. We do know God cares. We know that somehow in the end, he works all these bad things out for his good. That, that's a big picture thing. And God sees, we don't see it, but, but God sees how it's all working out. And we know that another one of the reasons God allows his people, he allows us to suffer and things like betrayal is so that we would have the opportunity to impact others with grace. That we would blindside people with undeserved love, with grace, forgiveness, that they would know their Savior too. If you're suffering, and I know we all got something, but Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He will be your strength and your grace. Thank you. Amen. I invite you all to please stand as we confess our sins. Oh, sorry, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please uh, remain standing for prayer. We'll do this prayer of the church today responsibly. Gracious Father, we praise you for sending us your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Satan and, and his followers seek to overturn our faith and love every day. Their goal is to separate us from your presence and destroy our relationship with your Son. Give us wisdom to be alert for their attacks and recognize the danger they bring. Protect us as we endure temptation. Keep us from becoming Satan's victims. Forgive us and restore us when we give in to him. Lord, make our faith stronger than it is now, so that we might know more and more that Jesus matters most to us in life and death. 
Give us wisdom and power to follow him and do his will. He keep us from thinking that sin is our harmless and cannot lead us away from him. Keep in your care all who are struggling with pain, battling with sickness, and facing death. Spare your people through Satan's temptations in their difficult hours, and strengthen them with the promise of your Son's ultimate victory over sin and death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the gathering of the offering. stand once more for prayer. Blessed Lord, you've given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Thank you all again. It really is an honor and a joy to uh, be here around the Word of God with you. Just uh, some announcements about what's coming up. We have, uh, since it is, we've just begun the season of Lent. Uh, we walk with Jesus to the cross. Uh, we have extra worship opportunities. So on Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock, we gather for a little soup, supper, and fellowship. And actually, pass this around. Um, Rebecca, could you, could you pass this around? We're still looking for some volunteers to help uh, bring soup on, on those Wednesday evenings. We gather at 6 for the soup, and then uh, 7 o'clock, we, we worship. Um, We'll be focusing how, yeah, once again on, on Jesus' walk to the cross and, and the suffering he endured for us uh, to save us. For those Wednesday services uh, this year, we'll be alternating pastors. So our sister church on the other side of town, Mountain, Mountain View Lutheran Church, their pastor, Pastor Schultz, will be coming here every other Wednesday. So this Wednesday, Pastor Schultz will be here. And he'll be giving the message from God's word and leading you in worship. The following Sunday, I'll be, or sorry, the following Wednesday, I'll be here, so on it, and so forth. So please, uh, yeah, give, give him, uh, give him a warm welcome when he comes. I'd like to thank everybody who made the service possible today. Uh, ushers. Yeah, as you can see, yeah, that we have people signed up who um, weren't able to make it today. Thankfully, volunteers filled in. Thanks, certain people. Um, so Joey couldn't be here today. So thanks to the Abokis, and thanks to Leanne and Anna. It was so nice seeing you, Leanne. And um, Jandel and Lori couldn't make it either. But Chris is filling in, and he did an awesome job for our first time cooker. So thanks, Chris. And uh, Micah just learned how to do the Mevo today. So thanks, Micah. What's the Mevo? Well, the Mevo is this camera. The one, the, the live stream we posted on YouTube and Facebook. So you should also check it out on there if you can't make it. Um, and Laura and the Abokis and all the other people who joined the Abokis. And Sam is here and he's going to count in the office. Thanks, Sam. No snacks, no teachers today. And then Josh and Marcus on the Parsonage Garage. Woo! Yes, I want to give a special thank you to Josh and Marcus who spent like <laughs> six hours yesterday trying to fix the garage door uh, to the Parsonage. We're very grateful for you guys. Thank you for uh, the, your service to the Lord. Thank you all. Sorry, sorry, cut off the applause. Uh, lastly, go one slide forward, please. Uh, it's a reminder that the, our, our Special Disciples of Christ Bible Study Series it continues next week. Uh, it's family weekend, so we're not, uh, we don't have special things going on here, but uh, that will continue next Sunday after the worship. Thank you all, and uh, God bless your week, and I'll, I'll greet you at the back. <laughs>